Mm, yeah. I love my HBCU. Uh, and bar? bar? I love it, love it. Yeah. I love it, love it. Yeah, yeah. I love my HBCU. Yeah. And man, yeah. I hope my team they won one. Yeah. I hope my team they won one. Mm, yeah. Man. I hope my team they won one. Yeah. I hope my team they won one. Yeah. yeah. I tune into the HCCU Sports Lab to see if my team wanna lose. If they lost, I'm quiet as a mouth. But if they won, she tab. Uh, I'ma do the dab, yeah. Dr. Cavill, he know what he be talking about. Mike and Charles, they know what they be talking about. They compress the analytic data with your hip hop. If you know them like I know them, they gon' tell you if your team, if they wanna lose. And who the ball, who the ball. So listen to Professor uh, yes, sir. Yes, sir. and pay attention because he's going to teach a lesson. Yes. This is Dr. Ville with Inside the HBCU Sports Lab with Mike Washington and Charles Bishop. Mike Washington is still out on assignment, so we have none other than the legend, Dave. Uh, man, Aggie Esports, I see you, Dave Rhodes. Uh, how's it going today? Pretty good, man. Pretty good. Appreciate the invite. I'm looking forward to this to talk about HBCU sports today. So let's get at it, man. Let's get at it. Charles, how are you doing today? I'm doing well, Doc. Uh, got an opportunity to watch the Dean in action today. That was good stuff today. That was uh, enjoyable. Hey, what you referencing? Uh, you, what you what are you referencing? The... Let me get this intro and then we'll let you explain. Okay. Right. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. A nice little tease on it. And I liked it. This is Dr. Bills Inside the HBC Sports Lab. Welcome to episode 536 of Inside the HBC Sports Lab radio show and podcast, the show that's covering the sporting HBC diaspora, all things HBC sports for institutions large and small. From the NEIA to the NCAA, we share insights and information on the HBC sports culture, HBC athletic aesthetics to facilitate the story of HBC athletic programs and the business of HBC sports. I'm your host, Dr. Kenyatta Kabil, along with my co host, Mike Washington and Charles Bishop. We're filming from our home studios and sending a signal live to KCW's 1230 AM studios with the Texas Radio Hall of Famer, Ralph Cooper, multi-Hall of Famer Ralph Cooper, in the beautiful home of Texas Southern University from Houston, Texas. With that being said, Charles, you were talking a little bit about something. What were you referencing there? You dropping a dime. Yeah, well, uh, we started off our, uh, you know, Falcony Institute as all the uh, faculty coming back to Texas Southern and we had our College of Education meeting this morning, and I have to say, Doc, you, you brought the fire. You brought the fire today. That was a good presentation. I appreciate it. I try to re uh, represent for all the HBCUs out there as we talk about on the show. And since uh, going back and the collective people have given me my nickname, the Dean, and I'm actually serving as the Dean of the College of Education here at Texas Southern University, I figured I'd make sure I make everybody proud and represent and wear it. Uh, correctly, as they would say. Doc, uh, you, had some, you had football coach vibes going today. Get one percent better. I like that. That's good stuff. <laughs> <laughs> That's what you have to do as the dean, though. My man. Yeah. That's what you got to do, Charles. That's yeah. what you're supposed to do. <laughs> David, David, we like to call you. You should have sent me up there. I channel my inner coach move. Mm -hmm. I, I, don't, I don't know which coach I want. Should I go back to one of the legendary coaches of HBCU sports? Uh, what legendary coach? You think about Charles in, in your frame of mind well, since we're talking about some Well, you you definitely had some Eddie Robinson vibes going today uh, with with the, with the motivation. So I, I was impressed. I was very impressed. Yes, indeed. Shout out to brother Eddie Robinson uh, in terms of that. With that being going going on, you like the Greek life, so we got another Greek person in here. I, I'm gonna let him share a little bit of that love, uh, which includes uh, the production part. Of the team, man, it's a lot of brothers out there. Go ahead, Dave. Tell them, tell them what you represent. The brothers of Phi Beta Sigma Fraternity Incorporated, Ada Chapter. So, oh, the blue and white. Good lord, and nothing wrong with the blue and white. <laughs> nothing wrong with the blue and white. But well, we gotta even it up a little bit, you know. We gotta, we gotta yeah. even, we gotta even yeah. the field a little bit. You no, know, you know, we gotta, we gotta even the field just a tad, you know. Yes. Well, Dave, I'm gonna let you show off a little bit. Talk about some of the legends legendary coaches that come to mind in the HBC world of football. Obviously, we have many in terms of basketball, men's and women's. And we have some on the baseball side, track and field, across the landscape for multiple sports. But since we're in football season, who comes to mind when you talk about football legends 
uh, obviously now independent in a lot of ways as we talk about HBC representing uh I guess I'm gonna be nice today. I'm not gonna say colonial. Oh, did I say that coast athletic? You, 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 you look, man, it's the coast. Previously, <laughs> you, you were attached with the Miak, and you still show sure love for the Miak and all due respect. Absolutely, uh, which I really appreciate about what you do. But with that, you've had a lot of experience yourself. What area? What comes to mind when we talk about legendary coach? As a student at North Carolina a t we had a legendary yeah. one known as Bill Hayes. I knew so if you want to talk, I if you want to talk know. about a legendary coach, it's going to be Bill Hayes. I got to meet him during the golf tournament last year that we do at AT. Phenomenal human being. And then if you want to go a little bit more current, who's now retired is Rob Broadway. Um, fun fact, crazy how, story how about far that. are they between the two? I was gonna, I was gonna ask that. That's a, that's a good one. Ooh. <laughs> I mean, I think <laughs> I th you know, the thing for me, man, like as a student, I had I had I had Bill Hayes, but Broadway literally pulled miracles up to, to fix our football program. So I'm wondering mm. how our Broadway to the nod there from that standpoint. Mm. Like he he pulled miracles. Like I don't think folks realize, like folks are picking on AT about their previous season, their last season, but I have sat through as an alumnus much worse. And Broadway got us out of that. I got to meet his barber yeah. when I was down visiting my family in Myrtle Beach. Which was nice. an interesting story to say the least. I was wearing my AT shirt and the barber was like, Do you know Rob Broadway? I was like, Yeah, he coached AT for years. It was like, I cut his hair and he called him right on the spot and I got to thank him. So that was pretty awesome. Good stuff. Charles, I'm going to go back to you since uh, Dave pulled out two out of the hat. He so, so much love for that. the Aggie. Boy, I, got, I, got, I got to get used to this. Anybody else you want to do You want to go to a Jackson oh, State legend who, oh, if I want you to do that, I, I, I know it's tough to name one, but where are you going? Yeah, of course I can go Jackson State legend, W.C. Gordon, but just in growing up uh, within the slack, I mean, when you're talking about legends, I, I lived during Archie Cooley, Marino Castle, and W.C. Gordon and Eddie Robson all going at each other. So that was phenomenal. And then I get to Jackson State, and St. Pete Richardson steps in. Well, with, with, with Southern. So I, I say St. Pete because he, he brought Southern, you know, Southern, I, in the 80s, I used to enjoy, you know, Jackson State Southern rivalry, the, the bands. But it, 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 it got different in the 90s. You know, they really uh, came on with the come on in the 90s. So, I, you know, those are some legends that I grew up with in the swag. Might have lost them. Might laugh, might have lost the doc, but I mean, we can continue going. And I, we normally get into this section where we start talking about uh, news and notes, uh, David, uh, around HBCU, uh, the, uh, the HBCU environment. And I want to start things off uh, a given acknowledgement. Uh, since we're talking about a a a North Carolina AT, I uh, wanted to mention uh, the passing of the great Al Adams. Uh, basketball legend and basketball Hall of Famer. And this story comes to us from HBC Sports, Al Adams, who starred at North Carolina a team before embarking on a successful NBA career as a player and coach. He passed away on Wednesday. He was 87. He was a native of Newark, New Jersey, and played for the legendary North Carolina a t basketball coach, Cal Irvin, from 1956 to 1960. Uh, he finished at a t uh, with a degree in physical education and, and history, and he led the Aggies to consecutive CIAA titles in 1958 and 59, uh, the great Al Adams. The only man who has his jersey retired and up in the rafters at Club Corbett, the Corbett Sports Center in, in, in a and Wow. The only, the only retired jersey we have up there. I like yeah, Carol that. jumped in there and and did Billy Nicks, you know, prayer of you guys, I got to give me some Billy Nicks. And what I, no, no, what, no. What I think is unfortunate about Billy Nicks is because of what happened to prayer of you, obviously in the late 80s and 90s. Mm. Uh, I think prayer of you became a figment of a lot of people's imagination for the worst things. They would talk about there was a period of the Aggies that went through that, but I think it was obviously much shorter. Uh, mm -hmm. The year may have been bad, but we had years that were bad. So because of that, I think over a period of time, Billy Nix has kind of been lost in terms of legend in this, certainly this newer generation, but even like you said, the past generations. Uh, but you talking about somebody contemporary of his peers, when you think about Jake Gaither, Eddie Robinson was on the back end, 
Um, yeah. Uh, and you talk about uh, the greats at Southern, legendary Mumford. Um, he had a winning record against all those things. And you talk about the fact that he had those uh, five championships at Prairie Viennium University, certainly is one that put up there. And obviously we have an article we did with Brian that talked about uh, the legends uh, where we gave honor. And I think it surprised a lot of folks when we put Billy Nix out there and they started reading, they was like, oh, okay. <laughs> um, so I'm glad that y'all had to do that. Uh, before we take this next step and get in our first break, Let's go to you, Charles, and give me what's on your mind in terms of some of the HBCU news of the day. Yeah, I mentioned uh, the passing of uh, the legendary Al Adams, uh, uh, who passed away this past Wednesday. But uh, some other news uh, around uh, HBCU uh, news is uh, the HBCU Athletic Conference. They will be holding their future basketball tournaments in Alabama. Another story that comes to us from uh, HBCU Sports. Uh, the HBCU Athletic Conference has secured a deal that will continue a strong partnership uh, for its postseason basketball tournament. The league announced on Thursday that the men's and women's tournament will, will be held in 2025 and 2026 at Stillman College in Tuscaloosa, Alabama. So uh, big news coming out of the HBCU Athletic Conference. Good stuff. Shout out to the HBC Athletic Conference uh, bucket list. I'm going to have to go and get into some of those basketball games down there against some of those rivals, particularly uh, give me a good reason to get to New Orleans and see that Dylan and Xavier. Oh. I know um, some people questioning the level of their rival because only Dillard is in the HBC AC with Xavier being in the uh, Red River Athletic Conference, but I still hear it goes down. So. I want a piece of that. Another one I want to get to before we get back to some football is I got to get to that Atlanta uh, game between Morehouse and Clark. Atlanta. I got ah. to be person. I got to see that. With that being said, Dave, I know, as you said, you legendary Aggie programs in basketball for so long period of time that people may not realize coming out of here in a lot of ways, those that don't go back that far. But with that being said, in terms of some of the modern stuff, What's, what's on your mind in terms of the HBCU news of the day? Shout out to Clark Atlanta University. Mm. Um, you know, they, you know, they received a record-breaking 46,000 prospective students that applied to be part of their freshman class That's with crazy. only 1,200 slides. That's unbelievable. That was more than the University of Georgia. Um, article from HBCU Game Day uh, talking about this. He, uh, for only 1,200 seats, it's, it's less than phenomenal. The class is large, but it's also accomplished. The average GPA of the incoming students is a 3.71. Five years ago, it was only a 2.8. So the brand is strong. Their retention and graduation rates are increasing, and that's what these numbers are indicators of. And overall enrollment at Clark Atlanta is 4,200. So I think to, to get so many students interested in Clark Atlanta University is, like, outstanding. Well done. Outstanding. Well done. I'm sorry. Let's talk about that. So... I like that piece, and Charles knows this. Uh, you've heard me talk a little bit about this on the on the HBCU Nightly, uh, where you co-host um, yeah. that uh, great show, where the great deal of the focus is on the MEAC. Uh, but obviously, they talk about all HBCUs, and it gets intriguing when you talk about some of that swack MEAC uh, fodder that goes on there. But I'm so excited mm. with that thing together. You got BJ on there that represents for the swack. Uh, Josh will kind of leads the way for the MEAC. But then with you on there. You got your old tales from the MEAC, and you get into that North Carolina Central Aggie stuff, which is uh, bringing a new level of folks that understand uh, how that rivalry is what it is uh, to a lot of folks. Um, it's fascinating there. And then there's the question where the Morgan State <laughs> and Howard is a rival, which is hilarious to me, which is totally <laughs> pouring us in the swag country about that. But I say all that because I. Charles, you've heard me talk about this. You've read the papers I talk about. I told anybody that would give me the time of day, and this is going on 15 years, is Clark Atlanta University, the Panthers, is the greatest sleeping giant out there for a private institution. Yeah. Anybody yeah. would listen to me, and I told people early, I yeah. said, go recruit those folks. Bring those mm -hmm. in your conference. Mm -hmm. Swack, I said, go get them. Swack is because it brings you Atlanta market. Swack has uh, did the next best thing. They played some of the conference championship games. You heard basketball. Previous baseball was there. Um, but I said, go get them. MEAC folks, obviously, it was talk about Morehouse. I thought it was a brilliant move, but I was like, you're sleeping. 
Go get it, Clark yeah, Atlanta. You, That's you the get problem. you get the duo. You get them both. Yeah. Get the rivalry right. with you. Can, Take the get them you, both. And, and, yeah. and, and, <laughs> and uh, just just to remind people real quickly, I mean, what makes them a sleeping giant? What makes them a jewel? Uh, is, is within this movement. I'm glad you asked that. One of the things out there is you were talking about earlier when we talk about academics. We had the Board of Regents Johnson, and, you know, graduate doctoral uh, EDD uh, graduate from the program that has r risen up the ranks and is now on the board of Texas Southern University. You saw so many of the connected folks in there in different ways that are in leadership positions. But people don't realize Clark Atlanta, because athletics has not been that strong, we can be front with that. People do not associate it academically in terms of the brand intensity it is. But it mm. is the only D2 HBCU, if we look at it from athletics, that has R2 status. There are mm. only 11 HBCUs at this time that have R2 status. And many of them are on a race to get the R1. People don't understand because you talk about Morgan State, North Carolina a and Jackson State, Texas Southern, and their push to move to R1 status, FAMU, make sure I get them in there. And the other ones, another one that is pushing and well on their way is Clark Atlanta University. So while we get all caught up in athletics, and I think with the leadership they have of Dr. French, and he has a great video out there where he's walking the yard, uh, reminding of us when we were in school, if you had some of those legendary presidents across the landscape that were visible uh, and students fell in love with the perspective of what they saw in uh, a president, in, in many cases, happened to be men, some women as well. Uh, but what it meant to be at that beacon, you can see when he's on the yard and talking to students, how many come up to him. And he's having conversations, knowing many of them named, they're majors. That's what creates a culture that is unique when you have a university president that can walk around the campus and folks respect him, but at the same time, see the uniqueness in terms of what that looks like. Atlanta University was a graduate school program, AUC Center, no doubt about it, Jeff. Uh, for those that did not know about that, it was Clark College, Atlanta University, the graduate program, and they merged. Um, and now they are stronger than ever when you connect what the graduate school does in terms of the research, along with some of the undergraduate components you have Clark Atlanta University, and I will continue to tell everybody, you know, when we look at this conference journey, one of the preeminent schools to look at uh, out there, uh, obviously a lot of folks look at Tennessee State, no doubt, R2, they're, they're out there and should be one you looked at. Um, Morehouse in terms of the brand, Tuskegee in terms of the brand in a lot of ways. But one that you got to keep your eyes on if you know anything about the business of understanding how you take the next level. It's Clarkie University in that major city of Atlanta University that continues to grow. And what many people say is a mecca for African Americans. And you see why. And this is another indication to show you why I talk about it. So thank you for asking that question, Charles. Let's take our first break, come back on the other side, and get into some football talk. On Tuesday, we broke down, for those that may have missed it, Obviously, those are there, you know, we broke down the matchup. We looked at it in terms of FAMU on an offensive perspective, Norfolk on a defensive perspective. We're going to flip it. Today, we're going to look at Norfolk State from an offensive perspective. And then in the segment three, we'll look at FAMU defensively, which I think is one that you can't wait to hear about because that is going to be the reason in a lot of people's eyes that have them at the top of the conference in the SWAC and see if they can start in Atlanta and finish in Atlanta, go back-to-back -back for national champions. Many people, if that's going to be done, as they pick them first or second in multiple polls, it's going to be based first on what they do defensively. Let us tell you why. With that being said, let's take a first break, and we'll come back on the other side, and we'll first talk about Norfolk State and their offense, particularly the big news that came out this week of how that may change some things in these two gentlemen's eyes. Stick with us. We'll be right back after our first break. At Auto Masters LLC, our mission is to serve our community by providing quality automobiles at affordable prices. All of our vehicles are inspected and certified to offer you the confidence in knowing you have a quality vehicle. Our goal is to provide you with a seamless process and positive experience for your automobile purchase. 
Financing recommendations and specific vehicle inquiries are available at your request. You can find us at www.automasters06.com and like, follow us on Facebook and Instagram. Also, please feel free to contact Terrence Miles at 601-927-7794. And oh yeah, tell him Sonia sent you. If you think all pads are exactly the same, think again. This is Always Ultra Thins reinvented with the Always Triple Protection System. This pad wicks gushes 90% faster, absorbs even more so you can feel dry, and locks odors in. Rethink your pad for up to 100% leak-free and odor-free comfort with the totally reinvented Always Ultra Thins. This is always like never before. The Cuvée Group is a Florida-based marketing and training consulting firm. We help businesses communicate to their target audience and engage them in conversation. We also help to expand their audiences, which will ultimately result in growth for those organizations. In addition to being a certified constant contact specialist, my colleagues and I are also certified in John Maxwell Leadership Principles. We use these proven principles to conduct workshops, training, and private coaching sessions for individuals and companies looking to take things to the next level. Contact us to schedule a free consultation. Issues today, don't delay, call Cuvay. Atlanta, Georgia. The HBCU football capital hosts the Cricket Miak Swag Challenge on August 24th. Florida A&M Rattlers, Norfolk State Spartans, Swag versus Miak. The rivalry is real. Come out to Center Park Stadium to see the returning HBCU national champions and two of the best HBCU bands in the land, the Marching 100 and the Spartan Legion. The day starts with a kickoff fan experience tailgate and concludes with a primetime matchup on ABC. For more information, visit MiakSwagChallenge.com. Compress the analytic data with your hip hop. If you know them like I know them, they gon' tell you if your team, if they wanna lose, yeah. and who the ball, who the ball. So listen to Professor uh, Yes Sir, yes, and pay attention, boy. cause he gon' teach a lesson. Yes. Welcome back in to Dr. Bill's Inside HBC Sports Lab. Sports Lab. Holding it down. Thank you there, Charles. As I oh, was yeah. doing a little cheat notes there, getting ready for this intro and snuck up on me uh, as we have it. With that being said, I want to get right into it, but I'm going to give some updates to kind of do this. I didn't realize that North Carolina A&T, since we got an Aggie on the show today, that, that A&T has only played in the MEX Challenge one time. Yeah. We're undefeated, though. <laughs> it was Tariq Cohen show. <laughs> it was a Tariq Cohen show. Yeah, and <laughs> yeah, he got down. Alabama A&M. What a show! Alabama what a show it was. Forty-seven to thirteen. Yeah, yep. he kind of stepped on the stage before he did it in the celebration bowl. Oh, yes, he really did. did was... <laughs> Let everybody know that he was the real deal. When we talk about Norfolk State, obviously the news came out that Alo. Is out in terms of not just for this game, but for the fourth four games, which is a whole nother discussion. But I was fascinated in terms of your first team quarterback, Adakuns, in terms of he was the lone person for Norfolk State on the first team. Yeah, yeah. this is a six member conference where you get a lot of chances to be on it. Well, to the credit, second team, you do have the running back, Kevin King, and then you have three from the offensive line, including the center. Um, when you talk about uh, Garrison Wheatley, um, um, while Kevin King is from Chesapeake, Virginia, uh, you have Wheatley that's from Johns Island, South Carolina, Vincent Bird Jr., uh, a junior uh, from Stafford, Virginia, as the first King was a junior and Wheatley is a senior. So some maturity on that line, but you have a sophomore offensive lineman, Samuel Eskridge uh, from Kings Mountain, North Carolina. Fascinating when you look at it in terms of Norfolk State offense. Charles, what are your thoughts in terms of this matchup, and where do you start after you heard the news that they lost their quarterback for this game? Well, I I think it it changes up things quite a bit. Uh, And when when we talk about going into the season, a lot of intrigue with a lot of moving parts, uh, but there were some constants at least. Uh, And one of the constants was Otto Coombs coming back 
uh, for Norfolk State. Uh, for him to not be uh, in the mix, to, to me, that changes things up dramatically. Uh, but as you mentioned, uh, all-conference performer running back, all-conference offensive lineman, second team, uh, uh, all-conference offensive lineman. I think that's a prescription for uh, what you got to do. But, you know, kind of the crazy thing is we don't know. We just don't know what are the weapons that are on the outside and whether they can get the ball to the weapons. Looking at Florida a and last year, it was the defense, the dark cloud defense that set the tone, uh, especially uh, when you talked about their depth at a defensive line. Do they bring back – this same dark cloud defense that we saw last year that was literally able to wear down teams uh, last year in the SWAC and, and could take over games. So I think that that's the thing that I really uh, take a look at because I'm intrigued. I'm intrigued whether uh, you, you've got some talent uh, for Norfolk State here on the offensive side of the ball, but it comes from the ground game. And we know Dawson knows uh, he can rely on the, ra- on the ground game quite well. <laughs> so that, I think that's a, an intriguing aspect to this game. So from my perspective, I do agree missing your experienced quarterback is going to be a factor. But just like you said about Dawson Odoms, he likes to pound the rock. And he likes to run the ball. So having, having that offensive line is going to be a huge factor. So I'm very curious to see if, and we're going to get into defense, if FAMU's defense is going to return. Because if it comes down to the trenches, Norfolk State could slow this game down and make it interesting fast. And that's a meak, that's a meak thing. Oh, yeah. You know, they, 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 they beat you up in the trenches. So. Oh, yeah. And, you know, we beat you up in the trenches, got the chip on their shoulder. We ain't got a quarterback with us. Uh, it's an interesting prescription for Florida a and coming into this game. They're saying that Jalen Daniels was – was competing with Coons for the starting position as it is. And he has been getting the first team reps. So it gives the indication that coach Odoms was aware that this could be coming down the pike from that standpoint. So he prepared accordingly, mm-hmm. uh, but nah, he did come from garden. Jalen Daniels came from garden city community college. So obviously he doesn't have um, division one experience, but if you have a fun out, if you have a good offensive line, cause I'm all about up front, man. So if you got a good offensive line and you can run that ball, you might give the quarterback some opportunities there, but we'll see. It's going to be interesting. Yeah, I'm stacking the box all day. You're gonna have to beat me up running the box. You will, <laughs> as you should. But it'll yeah. be. But the, but their offensive line is legit. They have a lot of returning starters. So you know that experience experience matters. Coaching matters. They have a new offensive coordinator, Jason Phillips. Um. So you know it's going to be interesting to see what what's going to happen with that regard. But we know that Norfolk State with Dawson Owens is going to want to run the ball. I think it's going to be obvious. He'll tell you that in a press conference. He's going to try to run the ball on you. So. Mm-hmm. Dave, let me ask you this question for those that may not be as familiar with this. And I love this for our CIAA people, um, SIEC fans that are on here as well, uh, as our MEAC fans that follow us. Um, Tell us a little bit about this matchup from your perspective. Um, Some of the robbers we seem to have heard heard about in terms of the MEAC before um, uh, you see the turning in the membership. A lot of people talked about Obviously, the family Bethune Cookman is in and of itself a uh, state matchup between public private institutions. But you had that A&T and FAMU rivalry off and on that was very big. And pretty much as things kind of uh, went uh, before they left both programs, that was a big matchup in terms <laughs> of going back and forth a couple of years. Uh, obviously, you had FAMU and Howard was one of those things uh, for a while. What are your thoughts from your perspective when you thought about the Norfolk State uh, FAMU matchup? Obviously, we only have five games being played there, even though both teams have been in the conference for a while, uh, because at that time you had uh, more. Lost them again. Okay. Yeah. Well, just follow up, follow up on the question in terms of looking at the rivalry, David. Well, so for me, that game, like they have, like like Dr. Cavill was saying, they have not played that often. Um, and FAMU is pretty much from a from a. Tell us a little bit about your thoughts on that matchup, uh, uh, the rivalry, or what you would call it, because I'm not sure if it's even designated it's, it's, as a rivalry. I I, from a I'm fan not, perspective, what do you see? The only I'm going to be honest with you guys, from a rivalry standpoint, for the game, they they have not played that often. They didn't play that often when they were in the MEAC. Um, right. so, so like they, 
But one thing's for sure. I, I don't have the series up right now, but I know Fam, Fam U has a dominant score on the series. I think I, I believe. Yeah, I think it's five games, four wins for Fam U, and only one. It was a home loss for FAMU. No folks that went on the road and got the win that time. So you're That's absolutely a rarity. Weird. Yeah. So they so because of that, I my argument as a student was always be is more about the bands with those two. Because FAMU has dominated that series, man. Because the, the the marching, let me tell you something, the Spartan Legion and the March 100, man, they they go at it. So so in that regard, it's gonna be fun for the game this weekend. So I hope they televise because I would like to watch that as well. But as for the football game. And it's never really – I've never seen that as a rivalry. Just like just like Erica doesn't see Howard as a rivalry to Morgan State. Like, I've never, <laughs> never seen that as a, as, as a rivalry. Shout out to Eric. So I just – I so for me, like, you have FAMU and Bethune. FAMU and A&T, they, they've, had their, they've had their run-ins a few times. Um, but, you know, from that standpoint, I never really saw like fam, you know, if I guess one of those big robberies. And obviously the MES schedulers didn't either because they didn't play that much while they're in the conference together. So no doubt. Charles, uh, as we talk a little bit about an introduction to the band before we go into our uh, second break, marching sport. Mm. You know, I've introduced the ranking for the last three years, and one of the big things that I put out there, shout out to AD Drew when he had <laughs> uh Celebration Bowl Executive Director John Grant on. He talked about you. He said, Hey, you know, there's a win and loss in this matchup. He said, Well, you know, blame that on Dr. Ville. He had me on the March <laughs> for it. It's a competition. There got to be a winner and a loser, which is another discussion. Mm-hmm. But to Dave's point, I imagine because of the distance, even though you had this big band thing, I'm sure that they didn't necessarily face off band to band that often just because of the travel associated with it which is one of the reasons they didn't play that often as a conference matchup. Yeah. What are you looking forward um, in terms of the band matchup, particularly now that you have at the end of the year, the, the HBCU band of the year, you kick off things Sunday right here in Houston with the national HBC battle of the bands, which Norfolk has participated several times and shown many people in this area what they're made of. Yeah, you know, even though Brandon King said he was underwhelmed, but I will say this that I, I Brandon I'm, tough, man. I, I'm, looking forward, I'm looking forward to this matchup because we just don't see both of these bands sort of get into the mix, sort of get into a battle stance, if you will. So, yeah. you know, the fact that you get the Spartan Legion, uh, you know, you know, growing up here in Swag Country to kind of check out some of the MEAC bands is kind of interesting. It's it's a little different. But they have a robust, crisp sound. I was tremendously impressed with them when they came down here to Houston uh, uh, last year for the National Battle of the Bands. And then, of course, we had an opportunity to watch FAMU. And uh, like my, my, my dear frat brother who looks at all these bands all the time, he's like, FAMU is going to be FAMU. They're not going to veer off what they do great. They provide you a great panoramic sound, if you will. So to get both of these bands to actually lock horns because – you know, let's face facts. We don't see fam. You travel uh, beyond the confines of of Tallahassee. They might get to Montgomery. They might get to Huntsville, but we really don't see them venture out beyond that. But to actually see them battle, I'm going to enjoy that. That's going to be. I'm looking, I'm looking forward to it. I'm telling you that, man. And and this could be something that could be submitted. This could be a submission hmm. for the banner of the no. year. You can go back and check it out for those that may not have called it. Uh, Executive Director John Grant was on AD, Brian and AD's sports rap this past past Sunday, and he talked about that that's an option, that you can submit this. You know, he Mm. didn't think they probably would because it's the first one out the box. But, hey, somebody might knock it out, drag it down, and get it done. So it is an option, so it's one to keep on. Uh, Just as also was said on there for people that didn't catch it, uh, if you're watching it streaming, you can see the whole halftime show. So make sure you check it out. As you know, uh, the over-air broadcast will go to the normal halftime show where they're talking about football and things of that nature. But if you keep it on your streaming or switch to your streaming uh, show, you will be uh, ESPN Watch. You may be able to catch the entire halftime. So I'm fascinated on that. I do want to give a shout-out, uh, as you said, Brandon King, uh, the battle of these independents now <laughs> with North Carolina a t uh, as well as Tennessee State and Hampton, which we're working together. We're working to put a show together 
um, as we kind of tease this out, it's a great time to kind of put that together. And Dave will be leading that uh, platform uh, where we have inside the HBCU Sports Lab. We'll look at doing multiple days of the week and we'll bring in different leaders as you kind of saw Charles leading things off when I took my sabbatical. We're going to extend that to even the next level where we'll bring these folks to lead uh, inside the HBCU Sports Lab and we'll do it from a perspective where we'll have a D2 perspective where we'll get more love in terms of CIAA, SIEC, and the IE programs. We'll have a program leading in on that. We'll go into the independents, give them some lead with the Aggies, Hampton, uh, and Tennessee State, giving you some updates of what it looks like in terms of the travel that they have, some of those HBCU matchups they have, and then when they get into conference play, we'll talk about that as well. So keep your eyes on that. That is something that we look to jump off, and then we'll look at even maybe giving you some Friday night lights in terms of what that looks like uh, with a different perspective that kind of leans on maybe some high school stuff, some perspectives of the pro as we look at doing some things with Kyle Mosley. Uh, Wilton Jackson bringing some stuff on Friday night, so where that fits. And so look for us to spread the love in terms of inside the HBCU Sports Lab and see what that looks like. So keep following as we give you an update of when you can find more information about that. Great tease, and so I'm glad you set that up for me, Charles, and Dave. With that, we'll take a second break, come back on the other side. We'll finally get into the FAMU defense. It is supposed to be the best unit out there among all HBCUs. We'll see what these guys think about that, uh, whether that holds true in terms of what they've studied this year. Stick with us. Be right back after this break. It's never too early to plant the seed, to share the tradition, and instill a sense of pride in your HBCU with your little ones. HBCU Pride and Joy Children's Boutique helps you share your school spirit with a wide selection of adorable kids' apparel and accessories officially licensed from your favorite HBCU. Visit HBCUPrideJoy.com and follow us on all social media at HBCU Pride Joy on Facebook and Twitter. Supermarket Sushi, really? No. Wait, Troy, you work here? I'm never not working. Like head and shoulder scalp shield technology, up to 100% dandruff protection, even between washes. Never not working, huh? <laughs> oh, Troy, you're such a good teacher. Yeah, I know. <laughs> never not working. Never not working. Never ever not working. Are you serious? Never not working. Dandruff protection that's never not working. Head and shoulder scalp shield technology. Hey, grab me one, too. Press the analytic data with your hip hop. If you know them like I know them, they gon' tell you if your team, if they want a lot, yeah, and who the ball, who the ball. So listen to Professor, yes sir, yes sir. And pay attention, cause he gon' teach a lesson. This is Dr. Ville with Inside the HBC Sports Lab. Let's talk a little bit about this defense. Um, if you followed ONG Strike Zone, uh, Brian and the team down there, Kelvin, uh, they were pretty straightforward that they see that the FAMU Rattlers uh, um, defense is, is going to be all that and then some uh, when you think about it. First team is, uh, of what they got done. I'm fascinated to see what that looks like. So I'm going to stick with you, Dave. What are your thoughts in terms of this FAMU defense? Is it as vaunted as some people think uh, that it should be? Obviously, you see the rankings. Most people out there, I think there are about essentially three, four teams uh, that are ranked number one, and among those is FAMU. Uh, some people have Central, like we do on Dr. Bill's Inside the HBCU Sports Lab, but right behind them, I do have FAMU, and some people have FAMU outright. Uh, what are your thoughts in terms of FAMU's defense? I think FAMU's defense is legit. Um among the best of HBCU for sure. I mean, I, I probably, I definitely will put Morgan and Alabama State's defense ahead of them right now as a cohesive unit. Um, but no. top three, ain't nothing to sniff at, right? Um, but they also no. also have some NFL prospects. Um, Kendall Bowler, man, from FAMU, he's for real. Defensive back for them, he's for real. 
I mean, they had two all swag first team defense defensive backs. So with him, Kendall Bowler and Deeker Wilson. So I I think their defense is still legit. I'm fascinated to see if they can keep that rolling because they got a new defensive coordinator as well. So it's going to be interesting. I think I think we have a habit of not realizing that coaching matters. And but I think with with uh, Coach Colsey <laughs> with him having the defensive chops, they should be okay. But it it it, it matters, man. I'm I'm a I'm a coaching matter type of guy too. You got to have the schemes to make it work. So. Yeah, and, and on your other responsibilities, obviously you do a show dedicated to Carolina Panthers. Give some shout out and love for that. Yep. Um, and so, unfortunately, on that side, you really had the understanding to talk about coaching matters, and obviously that's the NFL matters there, but that's not the only place it matters. So that's a good point. Charles has tried to share us multiple times on that issue in terms of coaching matters. Charles, you can share a little more about that, and then we'll get into your thoughts in terms of where you are on this family defense. Well, I, I want to get into my thoughts on where I went with this Florida defense, Florida a m defense. Do, like, you believe, <laughs> do you believe they are a bag of chips? Uh, are you, are you, I mean, you, what are we basing it on? I mean, I don't see not one. I don't see not one first-teamer, you know, swag first-teamer on the defensive line, and that's where they made their bones last year. Now, mm. granted. Coach Cozy, you know, he comes from the yep. defensive side of the ball, and Kendall Bowler is an NFL prospect. But, I mean, are we really going to get a really good barometer against Norfolk State? That, that's, 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 that's the question that I'm, I'm curious about. I mean – Well, from the one point, I think it would be interesting, particularly when you talk about that front line. Linebackers, uh, they're going to have to make their plays. But, boy, you're talking about one thing, Norfolk, you got to imagine, particularly with the quarterback out, to your point, they're going to try to run the ball. So we should get a pretty good cl- glimpse to see what fam you can do against the run. That's for sure, right? And yeah, particularly we, we how effective know. they can be with those up front. Go ahead, right. Dave. We will know very quickly if that defensive line is legit. We're going to find out within the first couple minutes of that game if that defensive line is legit. Because if it's not, it's going to be a long day. I mean, Because you're not going to want to throw – you got two all swack guys and an NFL prospect on the defensive back side of the ball. Precisely. I'm going to try to throw Precisely. to that. <laughs> and I'll just use the Florida a m logic that they used on me in 2023. You can't lose that amount of talent and just expect for things just to be exactly what it's going to be. But, hey, just like you, you pro- they probably think everything's going to be okay. No, Charles was one of the first out there as much as he had for T.C. Taylor, and he liked what T.C. Taylor was beginning to build. He said T.C. Taylor would get there. But he was one of the first out there and said uh, Jackson State would be okay, but they're not, they've are not. lost a lot of talent. He didn't see them fighting necessarily for the top of the conference. He wanted to see a strong, respectful season, and I think they got that. Seven yeah, four is nothing to sniff at. Uh, but all right, right. lost, man. Yes, that's just, but back to this matchup in terms of that, I do want to ask you, Charles, this perspective, and then I'll get your thoughts on this as well. Obviously, when we think about this great secondary of FAMU, what are your expectations of what they can do against the run? You know, all the times, it, yeah, it'd be nice if you're front seven, certainly your front four and your linebackers can make plays. Uh, but if you're going to be really effective in the run, you're going to need those deep backs particularly if you know a team is going to run, it's kind of sneak down. Make yeah, it yeah, yeah. And make it a little more faster. What do you yeah, see about the team being able to get into some tackles on this game? Well, I think uh, to David's point, I mean, uh, that that's one of the things that you're going to start kind of taking a look at. You know, can uh, does Florida a and have to commit an extra person uh, to, to, to help out, uh, to, to load the box, if you will? And, you know, I'm, I'm until y'all prove that y'all can throw on – these these corners that I got, yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna have eight guys <laughs> sitting somewhere, you know, uh, uh, packing the box, if you will. So I, I think that's gonna be a very interesting cat and mouse game. It could open up some things deep uh, for Norfolk State, but you know, I, I think we're all expecting Norfolk State to try to run the football and run the football heavy, and that's gonna be one of those early indicators of uh, whether there's uh, there's a red flag or whether Florida a ms defense is still legit because they didn't lose much uh, with regards to the to the defensive line and the backers. I, I mean, Wilson sneaks in here and says the Tigers going to be first or second. Dave, going to give me your thoughts in terms of that secondary. 
particularly of how effective you think they can be in terms of the run? I mean, I think they'll come up and hit. And I think, for like I said before with Bowler, I think he's probably going to be willing to come up there and hit. Now, that being said, I'm pretty sure you'd probably prefer to not to do that because most cornerbacks don't like to hit. That's not something they prefer to do. But I think they'll, I think they're going to be willing to go and put their nose out there and do what they need to do. Um, because otherwise, it's going to be a long day. Like I, I, I mean, we they got a they got a two headed monster over there in Norfolk State, so it, it's going to be a long day. It's going to be a long day if that defensive line is is not the same that we that was what they expect them to be. If it's not what what fam you expect them to be, it's going to be a long day. Tell the boys, it's, show me, teach me, show right, it's, me, it's, teach me. It's going to be fun because I, I love the I love to watch those type of games. Man, I like the slow games, the slow burns, because it stays competitive, gets you off your seat. I don't need to always have the big plays. Uh, these these are the type the trench play games. These are the type of games I like to see. So yeah. I'm kind of looking forward to that if, yeah, it, if it comes yeah. down that way. He he, he got spoiled with uh, Broadway a little bit in terms of physicality of offensive team not being too excited about just passing the ball. If you can run effectively, mixing the pass, you can get things done. In the course of the Aggies, I give him credit. You can win some of those national championships as well. Charles, well, Matthew, we, 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 of, we had one that threw, remember with uh with Coach Washington. Well, yeah, his famous we line. Chicken, we, we make what? All we do is make chicken. That's us, that's us. <laughs> we do is make chicken. That's all we do. Man. Boy, that was one of the best lines out there. Man. Best Man. lines out there. Shout out to Coach Keaton at Clark Atlanta University. Uh, they told us it's rat poison. <laughs> rat poison. Oh, my goodness. How dare you tell me my team good? That's rat poison. I, I mean, can, can, but can you blame him though? We got, I understand uh, he probably. Brought, I understand he brought half an island with him, but can you blame him? Yeah. <laughs> hey man, he gets a lot of love. I I tell y'all, y'all better watch out for Coach Keaton over there at Clark Atlanta University. I tried to tell folks they got it right last year with basketball. Nobody listened to. Him. Yeah, Coach Keaton trying to sneak up on take the next Now he gonna, he gonna turn it around fast. All right, yeah, he, he, gonna, he gonna turn it around fast. Yeah. Yeah, he tried to sneak up on folks. He ain't want he ain't want you to put the spotlight on him that fast. <laughs> look, man, I, I'm from Columbia, so I'm, look, I'm from Columbia, man. I know what he did in Allen. So yeah. it, look, you turn Allen around, you you can make miracles happen, man. So it's gonna be interesting. <laughs> Let me ask you this question on both sides of this. You, Charles, um, what are your thoughts in terms of the depth between these two teams? Depth, Norfolk State, depth for uh fam you. Which direction are you going with that? You see it even. See, fam, you have a little more depth, and how will that play out in this game and the rest of the season? Well, I think one of the big things that we saw uh, in the offseason is just uh, fam, you was able to keep their recruiting. Uh, and I think that's a, a goes big in terms of when you're talking about depth. I mean, they had one of the best recruiting classes uh, coming into uh, this upcoming season. I think that plays out uh, uh, eventually. Uh, and normally we start seeing – Quality depth, uh, quality depth kind of takes hold uh, somewhere around the third quarter and where you start kind of wearing a team down a little bit. So that'll be a very interesting thing to kind of pay attention to uh, who has that quality depth. And based on what we've seen Florida a and bring in, I sort of give the edge to them in that regard. Shout out to HBC Band Talk, Hell Wildcats. Fascinating to see what they got. They got Clark Atlanta Panthers on their schedule too. That's one that makes me a little nervous about the uh, <laughs> FCS D2 matchup. It is in Daytona, so it uh, shouldn't be a problem. But that's one, if they get rolling, as you talk about Clark Atlanta, uh, that's one they can snack out of there. And we it'll get a lot of folks paying attention to that rat poison after that one. Shout out to A.J. Niles. All wins are good wins. Coach Brad Webb is another good one. Dave, yeah, what are your man. thoughts in terms of the depth uh, of FAMU, Norfolk State? Uh, where do you see they fit in terms of who may have the edge with the depth? Uh, in terms of that matchup, I give the edge. I give the edge to FAMU, but I will say, Norfolk State ha- bringing back the majority of their starters is a is a side too, right? So I think we always have to take that into account. And I know they didn't have the greatest season last year, but at the same time, when you start thinking about the fact that they have that cohesiveness, and I think that's going to matter too. But when you talk about long term throughout the game, I'm still going to give the edge to FAMU because of how much recruiting they've done. Because they they even though they lost a lot of players, they've 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 refilled. We just got to see if they can play together. Yeah, in a couple another of days. Good, another good point in terms of what that looks like. Obviously, in these last couple of matchups, Jackson State pounded on South Carolina State last year, thirty-seven to seven. 
Now, the year before that, in 2022, you had Alabama State beating Bison 23 to 13. People call that the weather game, but it still goes down with the Hornets getting it done. Uh, 2021, you had North Carolina Central probably making their statement in terms of what things to come. Uh, they defeated all Corn State Braves, which surprised some people, 23 to 14, uh, as they got it done. And then you go 2020, COVID year, so there was no game. That was supposed to be a South Carolina State Gremlin. Uh, 2019, Bethune-Cookman and Jackson State. Bethune-Cookman came from behind. Jackson State dominated that game early. Uh, Bethune-Cookman Wildcats uh, got it done 36 to 15. In the first game, when things switched and moved the game from home and home for two years, with one of them being canceled by rain and then being in Florida for a while at Citrusburg, uh, opening up things in Legion Field, uh, that was a win, if you would, uh, with Prairie View. Uh, they viewing the new coach at the time. Uh, Prairie View Panthers beat up North, North Carolina Central 40 to 24 in that matchup. Fascinating when you think about what took place. That that means that since the game has moved to Atlanta, the edge goes to the swack in terms of those matchups, uh, winning uh, four of those uh, games with one going to uh, Bethune Cookman four and one. So it'd be fascinating to kind of see what that looks like. Overall, edge obviously is to the MIAC. Uh, I'm Fascinating to kind of see what continues to take place. Uh, 2025, you have North Carolina Central Eagles to, with the Southern matchup. In 2026, is Howard Bison and Alabama a and Bulldogs. You know, Doc, go ahead, John. One, one of the things that jumped out at me, especially last year, and we talk about uh, the MIAC and, and they're just winning in the trenches. Jackson State in that game, and I was very surprised by that. They were able to beat South Carolina State up in the trenches. So that's just mm -hmm. one of those things going to be looking at in regards to this game. We talked about uh, whether, you know, Norfolk State has to slow things down and kind of whoop on FAMU. You know, we I, I'm curious to see the amount of talent that FAMU uh, brought in, whether they can hold up under, you know, what we, what we would think would be that withering MIAC attack of, of ground and pound. Here, here's the thing when I think about this game, and it, and and as you know, I, we talk a lot of Miyak on HBC nightly. But here's the thing for me when I think about that game, when it comes to the Miyak, you know, as a whole, as a conference, we don't know. Like we we have no idea what this is going to look like on the on the Miyak side of the ball, right? Like everybody's got a new quarterback, and yeah. I mean everybody, mm -hmm. everybody got a new quarterback. Everybody trying to figure it out, right? So for me. It's clear because of what happened with Otto Coons. Because prior to the season, we were thinking Otto Coons was going to be the most experienced quarterback in that conference. So now you that that individual had got to go through his reg, uh, violation in, in the four games, and so now we're sitting here with a quarterback that's only played community college, never played Division One ball, but we know Dawson Odom can coach. I don't think he's forgotten how to coach. No doubt. Yeah. So so for me, from that perspective. I think Dawson knows he's going to – Coach Odom knows he's going to have to slow this game down because if FAMU starts fast, similar to what happened – starts fast, similar to what Jackson State did last year, then it's going to – this is this game is going to get out of hand real fast. So, like, it's imperative that Norfolk has to have to keep this game and slow this game down. Great points. We'll take our last break. We'll come back on the other side talk a little bit about HBC NIL, new article that came out. Quoted in that article along with some other individuals in terms of uh, the commissioner as well as several coaches. So we'll talk a little bit about that and get these gentlemen thoughts uh, before we close out the show. Stick with us as we get into our last break and come back on the other side. At Auto Masters LLC, our mission is to serve our community by providing quality automobiles at affordable prices. All of our vehicles are inspected and certified to offer you the confidence in knowing you have a quality vehicle. Our goal is to provide you with a seamless process and positive experience for your automobile purchase. Financing recommendations and specific vehicle inquiries are available at your request. You can find us at www.automasters06.com and like follow us on Facebook and Instagram. Also, please feel free to contact Terrence Miles at 601-927-7794. And oh yeah, tell him Sonia sent you. 
Atlanta, Georgia. The HBCU football capital hosts the Cricket Miak Swag Challenge on August 24th. Florida A&M Rattlers, Northfolk State Spartans, Swag versus Miak. The rivalry is real. Come out to Center Park Stadium to see the returning HBCU national champions and two of the best HBCU bands in the land, the Marching 100 and the Spartan Legion. The day starts with a kickoff fan experience tailgate and concludes with a primetime matchup on ABC. For more information, visit MiakSwagChallenge.com. Compress the analytic data with your hip hop. If you know them like I know them, they gon' tell you if your team, if they wanna love that. And who the ball? Who the ball? So listen to Professor, uh, yes sir, yes sir. And pay attention, boy. Cause he gon' teach a lesson. Yes. Dr. Mills inside the HBCU Sports Lab with Mike Washington, Charles Bishop. Mike Washington is out on assignment. We're here with David and Charles Bishop as we prepare to head to Atlanta. Charles and myself. Dave, are you going to be able to get down there or are you going to be watching it on television as ABC, 7 o'clock at night, prime time? What are your thoughts? I'm hoping to be watching it in 4K <laughs> in my <laughs> studio. <laughs> And I'm gonna enjoy it. I'm gonna enjoy the whole, the whole, the whole game. I'm looking forward to it, man. Because yeah. college football's back. I would be in yeah. HD for this one. <laughs> that means you're gonna have your surround sound as well, man. Oh yes. Oh yes, sir. Yes, sir. It's don't, gonna be. Don't let it get you food now. Dave still comes down to to the celebration bowl. We got the uh, closed rank uh, last year in terms of getting it and getting things started the right way the day before uh, and early that morning. So uh, we look forward to continuing those. Uh, shenanigans, if you would. But let's get into this article uh, from AP. Uh, Prospects, a player, pay another wrinkle for HBCU schools where a big NIL deal still taking root. Uh, athletic programs at historically black college university are facing another wrinkle. Uh, this is by John Zinner, uh, AP, AP sports writer that was released uh, a couple of days ago. Fascinating. I got a chance to get a quote in here. I also got a chance to hook him up with a Mark Smith, uh, who is, came up with the Icon 1901 Collective in the April of 2022. And then he spread it out where he now helps a lot of HBCUs uh, just finished some big deals with Prairie View A&M University. And he's quoted in here as saying, quote, these kids want to be inclusive in the NIL space. And many of these universities don't have the resources in quote Smith. So he's been able to go out on a more national perspective and provide NIL deals uh, with HBCUs that have worked with him. As I said, he's worked with Grambling, Prairie View, and a couple of other ones to name in terms of how he's gotten in space. There's some big deals that are going to be popping up on the screen pretty quickly. But one of the things that article talked about is on the Outside the biggest and wealth athletic programs, wealthiest athletic programs, the final strain of offering robust NIL options to colleges is a constant concern. It's often especially pronounced at HBCUs. The four major HBCU conferences recently agreed to work together to increase the value of HBCUs and send more athletes to the pros, but now there is a wrinkle with this NIL. We talked about NIL space. We've talked about obviously the house. Uh, lawsuit and where it's going. So this is another wrinkle and another perspective uh, where he got some expertise uh, from those uh, that uh, are around the culture. I had a chance to be quoted in the article and interview for it. The quote that uh, I was quoted in, among others in here, was, quote, there may be some questions about how are they going to be able to navigate this. But it's past experiences, any indication they'll be find a way uh, based on the alumni coming together and figure out a way to push these institutions forward, end quote. Um, and so that's one of the perspectives of coming back. Some of the coaches obviously talk about their concern. Uh, SWAC uh, commissioner also made a statement in here. Uh, as he said, he doesn't know what the athletic landscape will look like down the road, but he knows big money schools and conferences don't either. Uh, and that whatever happens will ultimately trickle down to his league and the rest of the FCS. So I think it's fascinating, too, while we'll opine on this and people want to know quicker than most, is that there's still an open framework in terms of NIL. So that's one of the things there. But with that being said, Dave, I wanted to come to you and kind of get your thoughts, uh, if you would, in terms of the overall article, and then more speak specifically 
where are the Aggies in terms of the NIL, and what do you see uh, from that perspective first? And then we'll take a bigger look, uh, if you would, with HBCU specifically at the FCS, NEAC, SWAC, uh, independent programs, uh, and then maybe even at the Division II level. So this article, it's it remains. It's, this is going to always be a challenge, not just for the the big money programs, the P four. It's no longer the five, so the P fours and things of that <laughs> sort. Like, no, it's not. I mean, you know, we're down to two yeah, boxes. Right. P four. So, so when you talk about the big the big money schools, they're they're trying to figure it out. They're under the impression that the alumni is going to take care of this, but we're already seeing ranges where they're going outside of the alumni to try to get this money to make this work, which is which is scary. I'll be honest with you. I think it's scary. Scary, fascinating, but scary at the same time. <laughs> um, because when you talk about ruining traditions, whenever you have too much money involved, mm. that's for traditions to go away. Because mm. that takes precedence over everything else. Mm. Mm. Right. So, but when you talk, but so this is from an HBCU standpoint, we as you said, we're always going to figure out a way to make this work. And the, the culture, the HBC culture as a whole, that's what's going to get the student athletes here because we always tend to, we always lean towards academics first anyway. We always lean towards that when it comes to that and athletic and then athletic. So I think that's a significant advantage that we have over everybody else because a lot of these kids tend to not leave with the degrees when they go over there. So everybody's just trying to chase the money. But from the standpoint of what A&T is doing, I mean, we have the Prada A&T NIL collective that we have going on right now um, to give to the, to do, do give money for the athletes. And then we also have the A&T Daggy Exchange uh, that we also have from that standpoint. So, because the, the bottom line is, man, these students, these students are looking for this money. Like, and in Sun Mastics, I don't blame them because they, if they think they're good enough right. to, to do it, they're going to go. I mean, it's just like a job, right? If you think you can make money somewhere else, make more money somewhere else, you're probably gonna, you're probably gonna walk. Um, right. You know, a and a- 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 T's football program has already gone through it. And uh, I had a, I had a funny joke a few months ago when we were losing volleyball players. I was like, yeah, volleyball players are getting paid too, guys. Like we, we have to start thinking about this. Like I think we're focused on the football aspect, but we've already, like a and T's already lost mm. football players to NFL, NIL. We've lost track stars to NIL. So it's already, it's already mm-hmm. hitting us. So you got to be able to work through that and be able to keep, because you're pretty much recru- recruiting constantly, and it's not just football, it's everywhere. Football, basketball, women's basketball, mm-hmm. across the board. So, But, you know, we have to come up with a landscape to make it so we can all do it. And I, I do agree, and then we heard recently about how we're trying to sell a portion of their basketball program. Well, Kenny Blake, a portion of their basketball program, which was which is smart. I love it. Yeah. But you, you have to, yeah. we have to think of creative ways to make sure we are competitive and we can still get some good kids here. So. I'm glad you brought that into the conversation in terms of uh, the dialogue about Howard. And we took a deep dive in terms of different ways you can look at that from that perspective. But going back to this article, Charles, from your perspective, what, what did you glean from this article? Uh, was it anything new or was it just another perspective of what you I've said many times about NIL. Yeah, I don't know if it was anything new, but the question I had, and and I think that you you brought up uh, in terms of being creative, that you look outside of the alumni circles. Uh, how how, and I guess my question is, it for an HBCU athletic program, is that a dangerous thing? I mean, because. I, I guess when you take a look at NIL collectives from an HBCU standpoint, you're going to run out of X amount of athletic donors or people who want to be part of an athletic collective. Uh, do you look at quote unquote foreign investment, if, if, if you will, you know, uh, I take a look at <laughs> LIV golf, you know, with, with, you know, with their, with the Saudi public investment fund, the way they I, invested in the LIV golf. Is is that a viable option for HBCUs? I mean, I'm not I'm curious yet. whether there, there's. I'm curious as to whether there could be synergy in terms of looking outside of the traditional athletic donor. I mean, we just there's a small number of us who who can who even want to do the athletic part, 
be a part of the NIL collective. We all know to give to the university, but to give specifically to athletics, that's still something that I don't know every, you know, alumni fan base jumps in on. Yeah, I do agree from that aspect. It, when it comes to like the Saudis, and, and it's funny because I, I do a lot of pro stuff as well. So I've been paying attention to how these guys are moving when it came to the golf. And you, know, and you see my shirt about esports. They're out here dipping the money in the esports. They got this big tournament going on with esports right now. Yeah. Out in Saudi cool. Arabia. I've been watching it. It's been, it's been fun to watch. But it's the pro- I went to one of the tournaments where you could qualify for it. So it's, mm. it's, it's a lot. To, to go through and now with the Celtics putting their team for sale, the first thing I said was the Saudis about to buy these guys because mm. they just want a piece of everything. Sure. Right. But but it's a matter of you know they're gonna go after P4 first. So like there was recently something talking about Colorado might be looking to get into the Saudi money. Like so when you take those things into account, when they start going to the P4, they'll probably go to the they'll probably head down to the next level. And when you talk about brand Outside of the P4, it's us. It ain't the group of five guys. It's us. It's HBCUs. Mm-hmm. We're the strong brand here. Mm-hmm. So I think they will get to us, but they're gonna, they're, they're gonna, they're trying to go after the big fish right now because they're trying to get the, the biggest value possible. So it so it's a it's a delicate balance of what you gotta give back to. So that's where it gets fascinating because they're probably gonna want a piece. They're not just gonna just drop the money in. Have fun. Well, I'm I'm really fascinated about your question, and I think our ability to navigate this NIL space is really for us to desegregate the market, right? To really diversify in terms of how we look at the marketplace. Yeah. Um, and so I agree with you from the framework that you know athletic departments are looking at um, those that support athletics in terms of the donation. Uh, but I would say in some places. Um, in terms of the totality of the marketplace, that's probably relatively small. The question that I have for me that comes to mind is, can you put an NIL program together that seeks new entry, right? For those that would be more enticed to support an athlete than for whatever reason, maybe the athletic program. So could you get some new people tied to. Uh, Just like you have on the academic side, uh, you have some people that prefer to specifically give their money for scholarships, right? Or specific programs. Maybe in some ways that you can get some new individuals uh, that would be enticed about supporting um, in their minds directly to the athletes, right? Um, And so that's something I think that you really want to be aggressive if you're an NIL collective or um, in terms of what um, you see going on uh, with Mark Smith, who's tried to open it up in such a way that you do not look at the individual institutions, right? That you look at HBCs more collective, whether it's an entire conference or let's say all the FCS programs or even the DVD2 programs. There may be some brands that want to find a way to get into the HBCU sports beyond what they would do to support the SWAC conference, if you would, as a sponsor. Uh, but they want to be more directly providing uh, financial means to celebrate their brand in terms of athletes. And so that may be a way where you can get a national brand to come on, right, to support athletes from an NIL perspective to help market their brand. The other thing that I think is fascinating that um, I imagine that you would agree with is I'm not sure how well we've done with regional or local brands. Mm. Uh, according a conference or institutions, we tend to look at more of the national brands and we've done relatively well at that level. Uh, but I think there are smaller businesses. When I think smaller business, you know, the mom and pops are one thing, and certainly you, you want to get in that. But I think there are the next stage of businesses that would be interest in terms of potentially finding a new, unique way to grow their business, right? And this may be an entry point in to do that. The other one is uh, that I, I'm not sure that we've really focused on is looking at the niche market of athletes and those that follow athletes or younger, current students, right? They have a spending power 
And there are some businesses that are directly wanting to attach themselves to that. So oftentimes, I think when we think about NIL and supporting, which is to your point, we think of an older demographic. But what about that younger demographic? Is that one that you can get into where a business would have an interest, not necessarily them paying directly in an NIL, but find an NIL that would support some HBCU athletes uh, because of they want to be able to get to that marketplace where they are uh, versus maybe their older alumni marketplace. So I think to your overall point, if you're going to really be able to take advantage of the NIL space, which is one of the things I got out of this article, it's going to be a need for folks to be more creative. And you open up the show um, acknowledging me as the dean giving a speech a speech in terms of where we want to go about the 1%, right? And part of that 1% conversation I had, to your point, and I'm glad now because I can tie it in even more so, is talking about 1% better every day. But also doing that in a strategic manner, an innovative manner. What are you going to do next? As you saw yesterday when we opened up things to all the faculty, we had a speaker that came in and we had the leadership from the president uh, on down to the provost talking about reaching this younger group about being more innovative in the classroom, being more innovative in terms of the touch points, which I'd imagine in a lot of ways is what you saw at Clark University to increase their GPA, to increase the interest of the enrollment. Uh, what we saw with North Carolina a and to be frank, is they took those large steps over the last 10 years to be the largest enrolled HBCU. A lot of that was not just being smart and putting your information, but there were some creative things that they did that they probably hadn't done at a and before. Um, and so this is a new opportunity to get into that NL marketplace. And the final point I make here, as you alluded to, you're right, no, it won't change if you're not being innovative in the approach of how you're gonna make things change. With that, we'll close it up. Great dialogue, great conversation. It's good to get you into the fold, David. We'll be bringing you back. As I said, we have the opportunity to now kind of showcase what you're gonna bring to the table, but I would be remiss if I didn't put this out there. Brandon King wanted to know what arcade cabinets you have behind. So I'm a big fighting game kid. So Marvel versus Capcom 2, Killer Instinct, and I got um, MVSX, which is Neo Geo. So there's a bunch of Neo Geo games, your Fatal Furies, your King of Fighters, things of that sort. So, you know, I, I, I keep myself busy in here. <laughs> I, I like it. it. It's fascinating because that's one of my things that I always want in my, my own man cave with arcade. So I'm jealous officially of Dave. So I don't have space to put them all. I got a bunch downstairs. Sure. I'm gonna. I might swap them. I mean, it's doesn't take so they, they. It doesn't take much to bring them up and down because their arcade went up, so it don't take much. But like, I got like a NBA Jam one downstairs, Ninja Turtles downstairs. I, I keep them. I keep. I keep my kids occupied here with all these games around this house. So. <laughs> I love it. Well, you you are you are what they call the best dad. <laughs> I try, you get all man. the points in great holiday gifts. I'm sure in Christmas gifts. Uh, uh, no, I get the same it, stuff everybody else do as a father. You know that. <laughs> I got the same gifts. <laughs> Thank you for listening to Inside the HBC Sports Lab. Make sure you share your podcast to your friends and colleagues. I am Dr. Kenyatta Khalil, the Dean of HBC Sports, coming from inside the lab in the College of HBC Sports with Mike Washington, Charles Bishop. Uh, again, we want to thank you for listening to Dr. Bill's Inside the HBC Sports Lab with Mike Washington, Charles Bishop, every Tuesday and Thursday at 6 o'clock Central Standard Time, 9 o'clock as we start up the following Sunday. 9 a.m. As Charles and I will hit the road, it's time to get on the road. Uh, we'll fly out to Atlanta tomorrow to make sure you can get your updates. Make sure you check out Game Time. We will be live from the set on Saturday. We plan to kick off around 3 o'clock, and that is Eastern time. Uh, so start tuning in, looking at us. We'll get more information on what that looks like. We will be live in bringing you all the sights and sounds uh, from the Meet Yak Swag Challenge 2024 in Atlanta. With that being said, we look forward to next week as we discuss the latest news right here on Inside the HBCU Sports Lab. Make sure you check out on Saturday Carlos Brown uh, with the Carlos Brown Show 
as well as continue to support ONG Strike Zone. And then on Sunday, as we close things out, make sure you check out Sports Wrap with Brian and AD. We have more things coming for you, so keep us on the mind. Lastly, inside the HBC Sports Lab 1 on Twitter, Facebook, and, Inst- and YouTube is inside the HBC Sports Lab. Follow me, Dr. Yada Cavill on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram, DR. K-N-Y-A-T-D-A-C-A-V-I-L. Dream big. Continue to move forward. We will talk with you soon. Charles? Of course. Test time, Dave. Oh, boy, I'm terrible. <laughs> <laughs> Roy, help him out. Help your sicker brother out. Make sure. Make sure. Oh, yeah, I was... <laughs> <laughs>